in a city plagued with crime. When hope is gone, only one man can stand in the way of evil. <laughs> so, welcome to my brand new video, my darlings of discipline, my soldiers of misfortune. The big question I have for today's video is... What was your first reaction to seeing a black superhero on the big screen? Given the fact that Hollywood is so morally and creatively bankrupt these days, they like to rinse and repeat. We are supposed to fight for everyone together. And yet I am looking at people suffer, people that look like me. Day in, day out. And if you don't believe me, Here's this doozy from Miss Michelle Rodriguez herself. I think it's so stupid for like everybody because of this whole like, you know, like minorities in Hollywood thing. Like stop stealing, you know, all the white people's superheroes. Like make up your own, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like what's up with that? And I couldn't agree with this lady any further than I could push my head through a turnpike somewhere in the San Diego Causeway. I have no idea if that made any sense, but I'm leaving it in this video because by golly, I am on a roll at the moment. The name's Nukem. Duke Nukem. No, I'm not here to kick ass or chew bubblegum. I'm not here to get even with those alien bastards for shooting up my ride either. I'm here to tell you to watch Jason King on Kung Fu Hot Dog. So watch out for him and his babes of the 1980s. Oh, and uh, one more thing. Hail to the king, baby. Now, the reason why I bring this topic up is because if Hollywood is so morally reprehensible right now that they can't create brand new diverse characters from scratch, then what about 1997 when we had the first live action black superhero based on an already established IP called Spawn? Yes, the Al Simmons himself created by the very Caucasian Todd McFarlane, a massive comic hit for those people who read Image Comics back in the day when it was an absolutely based title. But of course, if you want to go further afield than that, 1993 Meteor Man Man. I don't like calling it The Meteor Man because it sounds pretty awful. Robert Townsend, he wrote it, he directed it, I believe. And yeah, if you watch the trailer today, uh, it, it's, it's hard to in the right place, except it's alienating many diverse factions of his audience. It just wants to narrow it down to a specific mindset. And unfortunately, when you look at the roll call of actors and actresses, in that trailer yeah something springs to mind where i don't think i can ever have the gumption to even go back and watch this film now eddie griffin robert guillaume james earl jones bill cosby but a year later in 1994 damon wayans brought in blank man and i've never seen this film because i was actually at the time i just thought what is this film trying to be but upon watching this trailer now oh my god I do want to go to my Amazon cart and add this to my list and hopefully receive the Blu-ray or DVD um, in the post by this weekend because by golly, I want to watch this film and perhaps give you beautiful people a drop down, a review, and you can figure out for yourself if you think that's the kind of film for you. No crime fighter. So brave. <laughs> want to try it again, pal? Why don't you shoot him in the head? Yeah, shoot him in the head. Uh-oh. Supergirl Blind Spots Season 6 Episode 12. E yikes. Let me kiss the bride. I remember the first season of Supergirl on CBS television, which actually celebrated the sexiness of Cara Zor-El and Melissa Benoist? You remember all of that? And then suddenly when it went to the CW, well, it just uh, went down the plug hole, basically. Oh my God, this episode of Supergirl was just undeniably super cringe. So you have Cara Zor-El being lectured to by a race swapped and actually invented out of the blue Kelly Olsen. Yes, Jimmy Olsen, you know, the red-headed brother who worked for the Daily Planet. Apparently, he's got a mysterious sister. Or maybe this is a uh, 
uh, alternate timeline universe because you know you can do that now can't you and everyone here is just too busy where is the outrage and uh, it's just awful because the whole episode centers around uh <laughs> Kara Zor-El being lectured to by this version of Kelly Olsen about her, her wait for it about her white privilege yeah because Kara is an alien she saves people but apparently she's been taken to task about her privilege by Kelly Olsen which I find very ironic by the way uh, and she has to do better the whole episode is about you got to do better you can't just fight for one certain demographic of people you got to fight for all people again I get the message but the way it's delivered here is lecturing white people for being very very bad people I guess this is what Hollywood is trying to do at the moment. It's trying to pat itself on the back, but in the process, it looks absolutely retarded and ridiculous. Uh, well, of course, <laughs> when, we, when we're talking about those two attributes, we've got to bring in The Little Mermaid, right, folks? So right now, if you don't know about the latest conspiracy theory, and I do love myself a good conspiracy theory, I'm not sure if this one really sticks the mud with me, but IMDB, they are curating uh, reviews bombing of the movie itself because there's lots of uh, I think 30,000 uh, particular reviews which have one star assigned to them so what does the algorithm tell imdb which by the way is owned by amazon aka jeff bezos himself so if you read this article here from yahoo um, our rating mechanism has detected unusual voting activity on the little mermaid or as i like to say on this particular title to preserve the reliability of our rating system an alternate way Rating calculation has been applied. INDB wrote in a note flagging unusual activity on the page. So if there was unusual activity on, say, Captain Marvel or any other title, why didn't IMDB even act upon those particular movies? Well, your guess is as good as mine. Now, just to further the embarrassment the Little Mermaid is experiencing at the moment, we even have outbreaks of fights in a movie theatre, folks. A children's film where fights broke out. So all those hard-working single mums of African-American origin who turn up at a theatre without the father figures, uh, with a popcorn and their refillable Cokes in hand, only just to toss it all aside in the movie theatre because apparently your experience was ruined by... Oh, I need a refund on my ticket. No. We getting a refund because uh-uh. I don't know. Who knows what it was ruined by, actually? A TikTok who got out of control? I've been doing this. What do you mean, tell me about my life? Well, you said, you, you said you said you don't know about your life. Black. Tell me about your life. Because I'm trying to get onto you because I'm black. Because I guarantee if Because you're black? Person, yeah. I guarantee if I don't a give a person, damn about your skin oh, colour. Really? No! Why would Who I cares? care of what colour your skin is? Really? I just think you're an idiot. Oh, thank you. I think you're an idiot too. That's fine. You're perfectly entitled to. Yeah, this so is, are you. So the like, show's fine. called Uncensored. I think you're an idiot for what you've been doing. Okay. I also think you're an idiot for playing the race car when oh, no one's really? mentioned your skin colour. Really? Okay, you don't have to mention it to... I don't care about your way. skin colour, Lizzy. Alright. Alright. I... But you know what? When it comes to back to black superheroes, uh, I often talk about this gentleman with great affection, Mr. Wesley Snipes, before the whole tax evasion scandal that much maligned and ruined his career. But did you know that before he played Blade in 1998, he tried to get King T'Challa, Black Panther, off the ground. The same Black Panther who was created by Jack Kirby and Stan Lee back in the day as a sort of an anecdote to the civil rights movement that was going on in a very turbulent America. And of course, Stan Lee later gave us uh, Captain Falcon himself, or should I say Sam Wilson Falcon, Blade, as that would be later portrayed by Wesley Snipes. And it's funny how Wesley Snipes, if he had the chance to play uh, King T'Challa, 
I would bet my bottom dollar that when the new version of Black Panther came around in 2018, that Marvel would go on record and say, yes, this is the first black superhero film that you'll ever see in your lives. Oh, we'll have to put Marvel at the beginning of that just to make sure that we cement that. And of course, they would deny that the Wesley Snipes version ever existed. But they did deny Wesley Snipes even existed because he brought out Blade in 1998, which established the first continuity of a Marvel character in three Marvel films, ladies and gentlemen. So it does make me giggle that Marvel continues to deny that anything was there before it. Just like how Hollywood continues to deny that diversity even existed before what they're trying to do now, which is basically rinse and repeat, recycle until we think of the next white character we can take and destroy. Let me be very clear. I grew up in segregated Birmingham, Alabama. Mm -hmm. um, I couldn't go to a movie theater or to a restaurant with my parents. I went to segregated schools till we moved to Denver. Mm -hmm. My parents never thought I was going to grow up in a world without prejudice, but they also told me that's somebody else's problem, not yours. You're going to overcome it and you are going to be anything you want to be. And that's the message that I think we ought to be sending to kids. One of the worries that I have about the way that we're, we're talking about race is that it either seems so big that somehow white people now have to feel guilty for everything that happened in the past. I, I mm -hmm. don't think that's very productive. Or black people have to feel disempowered by mm -hmm. race. I would like black kids to be completely empowered to know that they are beautiful in their blackness. Mm -hmm. But in order to do that, I don't have to make white kids feel bad for being white. Which now brings me to, folks, are you ready for this? We are getting a live action version of a film nobody asked for because we love the animated films by themselves of How to Train Your Dragon. Now, the monstrosities that are beholden in front of me are none other than Nico Parker, who is Thandi Newton's daughter. And she, of course, played an awful rendition of Sarah in the equally awful HBO version for The Last of Us. The unfortunate reprobate standing next to Miss Nico Parker is of course Bella Ramsey so with nepotism at hand because yes you can now walk through that door with no acting experience in front of you as long as you've got some famous acting parents we're going to give you a job but hey if you happen to be diverse that's also an equal bonus points that we're going to put right there right now quoting fat boy slim but honestly uh, the fact that <laughs> Miss Nico Parker is playing Astrid, a name itself that is steeped in Scandinavian mythos and origin. She is going to be playing your Astrid Hoffman. And of course, some people are going to be crying out saying, why or oh, why is Hollywood doing this again? And in fact, that's exactly what they're doing with the announcement of Miss Nico Parker's casting as Astrid. Edward King, here comes the race swap, folk. And of course, other people have voiced their cries of derision, of dismay. I myself am thinking, why is Hollywood doing this again? And in fact, one person summed up so well that I had to actually incorporate it here. Uh, Dawson Hunt. Uh, so there were no blue-eyed, blonde-haired, Nordic-looking actresses available. I mean, I would have gone one step further and said, well, you could have just cast a Nordic actress if you really wanted to get the authenticity in. That's why people like Robert Eggers, when he made The Northman, I guess people weren't really batting an eyelid, but I guess Robert wanted to say, hey, you know what? I want to make a film that is true to the source origin, the source material, even though it's a character from scratch. And I just want to do my own little thing. And thankfully, the film did not get that retribution that I thought it might get. People just start in the movie who wanted to make a film based in that time and give it their... I, I guess their best shot, like Pat Benatar. Now, before you moaning Mary start attacking me in the comment section below, yes, How to Train Your Dragon from 2010 is set in the Viking era. It also doesn't escape me the irony that the character of Astrid Hoffman was voiced by none other than, wait for it, ugly Betty actress herself, America Ferreira. But did anybody give a toss about that? Of course not, because she's just an actress, Latina, who just happened to be the right fit for the character. 
But I don't ever recall at the time people were protesting about the fact that she didn't have a Norwegian actress or another Scandinavian actress to take that role instead of somebody like her because it didn't matter. Of course now, you've got How to Train Your Dragon. They're still casting the characters. Stoic the Vast, as played by the great Gerard Butler himself. If they get Lizzo to play that character in a live action version, my work here, ladies and gentlemen, is absolutely done. <laughs> and I cannot wait for the glorious fall of Hollywood. And as a casual reminder, folks, we've got Bella Ramsey, Nico Parker. I'm going to throw in Zendaya into the mix as well. This is your future of Hollywood starlets, Generation Dead. <laughs> Yes, I'm talking to you because I am from Generation X, the best generation ever. In my time, I had Jennifer Connelly, Mia Sarah, other assorted babes from the 1980s in pinup form, in film form to enjoy the heck out of. And uh, yeah, I'm going to treasure those memories, memories forever and ever. But I think what Hollywood is doing right now is pretty nefarious. They are bringing up the conversation about race again in a very casual, not so subtle manner. When you hear about a live action remake and suddenly the person that you were very used to seeing back in the day has now been changed before the, your very eyes. But you know what, folks? I just have to end this video on a bit of a Debbie Downer right now because when we talk about diversity in Hollywood, when we talk about the inclusion of others, because apparently they never existed before, we're talking about a literal playing field. So this is a Channel 4 documentary that was made two years ago. It's received immense backlash, and quite rightly so. 54,000 downvotes compared to 12,000 upvotes will tell you something. So basically, they're taking these kids probably around 14 years of age. They've got them in football gear. They're literally on a playing field because apparently the audience is so stupid, they won't actually understand why that's being referenced at all. Um, and they're all of different ethnicities. Um, I guess if they were going to remake this or revisit this documentary now, you'd probably have some of the pronoun brigades right here as well. So they spread these kids out on the football pitch and they've been asked questions about racism. And uh, yeah, do you want to hear some of this, folks? Because it's pretty awful. How do you feel standing there in the field of runners? I uh, kind of feel a bit alone. A bit alone. I, I, I can't really see. I'm literally just by myself more or less that society nowadays really isn't fair and i just wish everybody could be equal the last point he made was actually very good you know it's apparently we're still being held back because of our color not our merit or what we can bring talent wise to the living room to the table when we've got to be pushed right back but i do agree with that point actually why can't we all be on an equal playing field I mean, back in my days in school, that was pretty much it. You you were successful because you were good at something, not because your color held you back. How ridiculous is that? So when Russell says, you know, we should all be on the equal playing field, I completely agree. This is where indoctrination begins, ladies and gentlemen, because if you're taking impressionable young minds, or should I say from the mouths of innocence, this is what they're going to be fed, and this is how they're going to interpret that information. Well, you know, we're going to be held back by a color, not by what we can bring to the table, because people who are supposedly deemed more superior to us will always be at the forefront of the action. And ladies and gentlemen, it is the wrong message to send, not just from the likes of Channel 4, but from Hollywood itself. Uh, and it's awful that they keep taking established white characters and re-establishing them as something a bit more brand new for the modern audiences who don't want to see this because at the end of the day ladies and gents the modern audience will see through the bs they'll continue to push it back until maybe one day hollywood will cut their losses and go back to what they did best entertain the believing jesus out of the audiences because by golly folks i miss the days when i can actually leave a movie theater go to pizza hut discuss why I love this film so much, 
go home with a big smile on my face, look at Amazon a couple of months later, and there's my title in the cart, ready to order. But do you know what, folks? Those days, I think, are long gone. We're never, ever going to get them back. So, ladies and gents, if you enjoyed this video today, please leave a like below. Please smash that subscribe button. Tell YouTube you loved what I did today. And if I were you, and if you were me, you better come back for the next video. Save yourself. There's no point in us all dying. I'll never forget you, my love. And no crusader has inspired so many. It's a big world, and we all have to do our part.